one of nature's deadliest forces. Every year, tornadoes kill dozens of people and create millions of dollars in damage. Maybe it's time to fight back. Hello, I'm Michael Holligan. Welcome to your new house. It's protection right inside your home. A super strong indoor tornado shelter that can stand up to almost any storm. I'll show you how it's done. And tornadoes aren't the only weather to keep an eye on. Super handyman Al Carroll has a state-of-the-art weather station you can install yourself. Plus, we're going to talk a little bit about air infiltration and how to save half of your utility bill each month by keeping outside air out. All this and more coming up right now on your new house. For a moment there, you probably thought your television was tuned to the wrong channel, or perhaps your satellite provider had connected you with the wrong link. Well, this is ENET. It is learning again, and I'm Ken Stewart. We slipped the opening for Your New House in to let you know that we have two new television partners here, Michael Holligan's Your New House and the Discovery Channel. I'll tell you more about this later, but right now I'd like you to think about this question. Is your community at risk from tornadoes and hurricanes? If yes is the answer, and for much of the country it is, then today's program has some important information for the residents and builders in your area. For many years now, the Federal Emergency Management Agency along with corporate partners, researchers, and local communities, has been working on ways to reduce structural damage from high winds and lower the death and injury toll produced by these storms. From these joint efforts has come the concept of above-ground safe rooms, a secure area in a home where the family can take shelter should a tornado or hurricane hit their neighborhood. Much of the research work has been conducted by the Wind Research Engineering Center at Texas Tech University, located in Lubbock, Texas. Recently, we had the opportunity to visit with Dr. Ernie Kiesling, one of the center's founders, and learn about the results of their work. In May 1999, FEMA responded to the tornadoes that swept through the Midwest, particularly Oklahoma and Kansas. Among the responders was a building performance assessment team. We've included footage from their work as well in this first segment, Safe Rooms from Research to Practice. inside uh, our safe room and it's a uh, six six feet wide and 12 feet long safe room and we have uh, steel reinforcement inside these walls and they're six inches thick and our ceiling is 10 inches thick it is a multi-purpose room for us uh, it's a safe place to be able to keep things protected from fire if, uh, if we have documents that we want to keep safe, there's a place to be able to do that. And should we need to be here for any length of time, we have a little table and chairs. We have a battery-powered TV uh, and radio, a um, little bit of water, flashlights, just the extra chairs for neighbors. Uh, if they should come in. We're just so very proud that we have it with this steel door and our latches as Texas Tech designed and, and uh, very proud to have it. F feel very safe. The uh, wind forces will be uh, somewhat higher in a tornado. On the other hand, they're higher only for a very small area and, and even uh, for a, only a small portion of the width of the tornado because in a tornadic wind, the wind speed is, is uh, say, if the, the vortex is rotating at a given wind speed and that's where the maximum wind speeds come from, where the translational speed adds to the rotational speed is, is where the uh, wind speed is going to be the greatest in a tornado. But then as soon as you get out away from the center a little bit, the rotational wind speeds die down considerably. So it's only a very, very narrow strip where the wind speeds are high in a tornado. Most of the damage has been, is done by wind speeds, say, well under 150 miles per hour. But in pro providing occupant protection, we feel we need to design for that worst case scenario. Now in a hurricane, it, it's a different situation. The wind speeds typically are not as high even for tornadoes that are spawned by hurricanes, but the wind speeds are of much longer duration and in fact they can come from both directions as say the, the passes eye yeah. passes pa close to the, the point of uh, that we're considering. 
So they're a different challenge, and furthermore, the occupants are going to be there for a much longer period of time, and because of that, you're also likely to have far more people in the shelter. Uh, so we have to pay attention in hurricane design to uh, uh, amenities, to more space, to some comforts in there, uh, because people are likely to be there for a long period of time. Obviously, uh, this the garage was not a very good place to be, or the workshop. You can see the walls, the door has been blown out, and the roof is gone. A lot of debris is going to be flying around in here. When we go inside, you can see all this exterior wall. The windows have been blown out, so you want to stay away from windows. Inside here, inside here is a good example. Here's where we had a major failure within the home. Obviously, some sort of missile penetrated this wall, and you can see the splatter on the opposite wall. This room would be very uh, dangerous to be in. Uh, it's clear it'd be filled with flying glass and debris, and that's your major hazard in, uh, uh, in tornado hits. First of all, there's a higher concentration of structural members there, and then in, say, in the case of the bathroom, you have some plumbing that uh, is affixed to the walls and to the floor that further anchors the building. So it's not surprising that the uh, <clears throat> small interior rooms uh, offer a higher degree of occupant protection simply by the, the way they're built and the size of them. Mm -hmm. And it becomes relatively inexpensive then to modify them <clears throat> to provide yet a higher degree of occupant protection uh, by hardening and stiffening. Here we have an interior hallway. You can see there's a lot of debris splattered around in here, but essentially anywhere within this hallway for this case would be a relatively safe place to be. Now my recommendation in this sort of situation, if we can come down the hallway, in here would be the bathroom. And obviously uh, what we've been telling people is get into the bathtub, pull something over on top of you. Uh, from everything we've seen, that if you're gonna survive the tornado, that's one of the best places you could possibly go. Another good place would be an interior closet. Um, uh, this sort of structure also will, will tend to be the last thing to go in the house. First of all, the shelter needs to be anchored to the floor, so we would, in new construction, and that's primarily what this would be intended for, leave reinforcement sticking up out of the floor when you cast the uh, foundation or floor. This be a typical four-inch slab or a six-inch slab? Yes, at least four-inch slab. Four that's inch that's slab. minimum that most codes the bar call has for. To go down. And in fact, yeah. for this masonry shelter, anytime we have the weight of concrete or masonry, it's recommended that the f slab be thickened or there be a footing under it, so this shows a thickened okay. slab. And then leave reinforcement sticking out of there uh, to anchor the shelter, build a conventional concrete block, or now insulating concrete forms are used as well for the uh, construction. Then upon completion of the walls, put a reinforcing bar into each cell and fill that cell with concrete, bend the reinforcement over to form the reinforcement for the ceiling and put a concrete ceiling on it. So that's a poured concrete ceiling? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. And the uh, ceiling must also be able to repel the falling debris in this case because some of the debris is lifted very high in the air and dropped. So this is simply one of the techniques and one of the strategies for building a residential shelter. and. It uh, is, I think, suited best for, or suited best suited for new construction, 
uh, for a retrofit, this is not uh, really suitable because you would essentially have to clear the area. So if we have an existing stud wall construction, then another strategy would be used for that. For existing construction, we would recommend uh, several others. This one is probably the uh, most suitable for uh, if you have stud wall construction. We would recommend double studs and double plates, both top and bottom. Mm -hmm. But this uses simply two layers of three quarter inch plywood for uh, for the structure, getting the structural integrity, uh, and then a sheet of metal on the inside to provide the uh, resistance and to- And would be on the per inside of the room? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And so in this concept, if you could get at it from the inside as you normally would be able to do in a closet mm -hmm. or a pantry without tearing things up too much, then you could strip it from the inside, uh, add the, the plywood and the steel and tie it all together. Before we add the plywood or the steel, we would want to anchor the lower plate to the floor and then, of course, you have to pay attention that the, the ceiling built probably in the same way is firmly attached to the walls. Would be some and sort of a joist hanger that would tie that. That's one strategy, yes. And uh, uh, then the walls must be tied together, too, because with the wind forces, the extreme wind forces pushing on here, there's a tendency for it to collapse. So the shear walls must be able to carry the, uh, the forces. And the uh, door is critical for wind loads because it, they must uh, carry the same loads that the walls see, and those forces can be either inward or outward depending upon the direction of the wind. And that's not an easy thing to do to, to hold that kind of wind pressure uh, with a door. This is uh, a uh, one that, that uh, utilizes concrete and Again, we would use the plywood to get the structural integrity, use double studs, but this just utilizes concrete block, four solid four inch concrete block that's stacked in there. This is not really that suitable for retrofit either because you have some sizing problems. The stud spacing is not uh, as good, but for a person who does not wish to use poured in place concrete yet uh, wants to use this basic concept. That's that's one way to do it. Another concept for retrofit with the, this one uses poured in place concrete, and we found that you can even use lightweight concrete there. Mm -hmm. But uh, there we add a layer of welded wire expanded metal on the inside, and then the plywood to get the structural integrity. Here, there's a tendency for the the debris to to simply knock out a cone like a, a, you see in a windshield, a damaged windshield. So this expanded metal would essentially arrest that and keep it from, some, from going on through. Also for new construction, uh, this one would work well. In new construction, uh, it simply leaves a space between two layers of, of brick and fill that with reinforced concrete. This is a little more expensive and requires, of course, a mason to do the brickwork. The benefit of it is that you have a finished wall on both sides that probably would match the uh, masonry in the rest of the house. We can use metal doors if the uh, skins of the metal door are 14 gauge or thicker, then it does not need modification to resist the uh, windborne debris. If it's lighter in weight than that, then we have to supplement it with a steel plate and, and screw a steel plate to it. Furthermore, the uh, hardware is critical because we can find no single latch that will carry either the wind forces or the, the debris impacts. So we recommend a total of three closure mechanisms. They can be sliding bolts, but we would prefer uh, dead bolts that can be operated from either side so that no one locks themselves in. I always had known I wanted a safe room, and this is it. Um, you can tell by these walls, there's 12 inches of concrete here, 12 inches of concrete here. The roof is eight inches. It's all poured concrete. Um, 
one thing that I didn't think of, the contractor did, was the door. They said to be sure and have a door that opens inward so you don't have to worry. I mean, if that bathroom had been full of stuff, we still could have got out. We still wouldn't have been trapped because the door opened this way. We don't have to worry about the door being blocked. See, it's two pieces of three-quarter inch uh, uh, laminated plywood, and then the uh, the inside sheathing cover is 14 gauge steel. And uh, of course, it's all screwed together and glued together, and it's all tied in. You have to put the the light bolts in uh, about every four to six inches, as you can see in these whole the walls and the ceiling are done this way. Uh, the uh, Texas Tech University ran a uh, impact test on this thing and. Uh, they had it all monitored and engineered, and they fired a two before through the wall at 100 miles an hour, and this was all tested and verified. And I used my own test on it in that I went to the firing range, and I got my 45 out, and from about 15 to 20 feet, I fired a bullet through this thing, and as you can see, it went in here, and it did not come out on this side. It did make a little bit of a dent in the steel, but it didn't go through. Obviously, the cars were in the garage, but there is no longer a garage. Uh, back here, this was the living room. Which is, you can't, we haven't been able to get anything out of it. It was totally gone. This is dining room, kitchen area. Uh, pantry in here. This was computer room back here. Obviously, all gone. Utility room, but the walls are gone, so. Um, this is, yes, the bathroom in here. That was the bedroom in there. Uh, this was my living room in here, in bedroom. And a brand new bathroom in here. We had just completed a remodel about six months ago, which is when we put the closet in. That would be a pretty bathroom. And this is the closet. I went with the, the, the inside closet as opposed to a cellar, mostly because I didn't want somewhere you had to go outside. The storm cellars tend to leak. Um, we were trapped one time years ago, a, a neighbors couldn't get from under their carport to the cellar because of softball size hail. So, I mean, there, something outside is, is just more dangerous. I wanted something, plus the idea of the closet, it's usable. I mean, I use it every day, you know, it, it's, that's my closet. So it's a room that, that gets a lot of use regardless of uh, whether you're using it for a storm cellar or not. This is the outside two walls of the safe room of the room addition that we did. As you can see up here, there's the concrete roof. It's eight inches thick. These walls are virtually, other than the dirt and debris, are unmoved. Why it happened that way even on down past the safe room, which comes to here, I can't explain why it stood. To the west, down that wall, I can't explain why the wall stood. There's a lot of walls standing in this house compared to the other homes in the area. The best we can figure is that this safe room protected the whole house. When the power went off, I just dumped up, slammed the door, locked it, and within minutes, it was here. It was here. And you knew when it got here. <laughs> it, it, it announced itself very good. Um, probably not more than five minutes total. All of this was, was done in five minutes. I mean, just the total, total destruction took five minutes. Even though you build this room for this reason, we just had never thought of, of, you know, nobody can ever imagine something like this happening. And we should have had flashlights in here and didn't. Um, we, it ended up, we were okay because it was still light outside once the tornado passed. If it had been later at night, we would have been in real trouble because you couldn't, you had no idea what you were walking on. Um, nails and wires and, I mean, it, there was no way of knowing what you were going to step on. It's, it's safe. I mean, this room didn't, it didn't move. It didn't rattle. It didn't, I mean, it, it did just exactly what it was supposed to do.
In our next segment, Michael Holligan, the host of Your New House, reviews safe room construction, supplies, and the equipment you would want to keep in that kind of a room. And he also shows us an alternative method for installing a safe area in the house. Michael Holligan Holmes has been a corporate partner with FEMA's Project Impact Program for some time, and this segment is one of several that addresses upgrading new and current construction for wind resistance. Every year there are 170 tornado days that account for over 800 confirmed tornadoes in the United States. On average, 20 of these tornadoes are labeled killers, claiming about 90 lives per year and accounting for thousands of injured. What can homeowners do to protect themselves? Now your first line of defense is at your home. It's traditional to put a storm shelter out in the yard, but who wants to run outside during a tornado? FEMA has come up with some plans where you can actually build a storm shelter inside your house. You can see underneath the staircase here where they've already put up a layer of steel, and now the guys are putting plywood up against it, according to plans that you can download off the internet. FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It's the government body that's responsible for safety preparation for natural disasters. FEMA's website is full of advice on how to prepare for any kind of natural disaster. There's an entire section devoted to plans for storm shelters and safe rooms. Home builders can implement these designs in the construction of their new homes. Ray Higgins of Jim Sexton Homes is such a builder. So Ray, you've got your piece of steel on the exterior here, and then a couple pieces of plywood, and then one on the interior? Yes, that's correct. The, uh, the steel is 14 gauge, the plywood's uh, 3 quarter inch, two layers, and this will go on the exterior with a single layer of 3 quarter inch plywood on the interior of, the, of your structure. And that's according to the FEMA plans, and what type of wind will that take? How much? That'll handle 250 miles an hour, so it's, it's a sturdy structure. So that could be a big tornado and it'll stand up? Yes. And I noticed over here that you did go ahead and bolt our bottom plates of the wall down to the foundation and then you put straps holding the bottom plate to the studs? That's correct. We've got half inch uh, J bolts and the, uh, the metal tie down straps to uh, tie the wall down to the, uh, the double plate. So not only should it not burst through the wall, but it shouldn't rip the room off the foundation. That's correct. Either. And then you put it underneath the staircase, that's going to add some strength as well, isn't it? Exactly. Well, we don't have an air can in here to uh, shoot studs at it at 100 miles an hour, but you want to take a few whacks at it? I can try. See how strong it is compared to a normal room? Yeah, that should be plenty strong. And you've still got another piece of plywood to put on the exterior, don't you? Right, so that'll give you an idea how strong the uh, this structure is going to be. Now, I hear you're putting a different type of shelter in another part of the house? Sure, let's go to the garage. Okay, let's take a look. Right. Here's another shelter in the, uh, in the garage we're building. It's by uh, Tornado Shelters and Closures. I tell you, that is something else. This is a big boy. Look at this solid steel. Hey, Dave. How you doing? Good, good. Yeah. Tell me, what is this built out of besides steel? What's this? This is a, it's made out of a three and a half inch tube steel, five, six inch thick, with a half inch polycarbonate skin on it. State of the art material. And if you're in a tornado, this would be like watching it on TV. You can see it come right up to your room, huh? Yes, you could. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we've done, we use a Hilti anchoring system with this. Uh, we've got some heavy uh, safety factors built into that area and the anchoring is designed, or it's, it's certified to FEMA 320, but our design criteria, we've beefed it up a lot more than that. We can take some really heavy wind loads on this structure. Sure, looks like it. What goes up on top? The same thing. This is a panel design. All the panels are typical. All the connections are typical except the door, yeah. and you would mount the same panel on the, on the roof of it. Is the glass bulletproof? Uh, this is not bullet resistant. We can make it bullet resistant with some thicker materials. So you could use this like a safe room, so oh, whatever absolutely. breaks in your house, just lock yourself inside. Absolutely. And they could see you, but they couldn't get you. That's right. <laughs> uh, we have the dark panels also in case the homeowner didn't want to see things flying at them or coming at them. So they have the option of going dark or the clear. Uh, the nice thing about this panel design is you can go, into, I can go into an existing home and measure up a closet, put it in the closet. You can make a home office out of it, change the colors. So uh, it doesn't have to be in the garage like this? No, it doesn't have to be in the garage. We, okay. Typically, we'd like to see them in the center of the home somewhere. That's usually the, the safest best area. And because we really want the homeowner to be able to get into it within 20 or 30 seconds, uh, anywhere from in the house. 
And bolted together like this, it should be plenty strong. Oh, it? uh, it's uh, it, the wind loads it can take are a lot more than 250 miles an hour. Well, I guess the biggest question would be the glass. Have you guys tested that? Yeah, we were. Uh, Texas Tech has done all of our testing. We got some footage of that. We'd be glad to show you. Now uh, they did the FEMA 320 test, which is a 15 pound two by four at 100 miles an hour. So Dave, is that what the glass looks like after a tornado? Yeah, it's a 15 pound two by four uh, at 100 miles an hour. Well, it didn't crack the glass at all, did it? No. Just, just made an impression? Sure did. We don't have the air can in here, but why don't you take our unofficial sledge test to it? And sure. See how it holds up. Wow, takes a big hit. Doesn't really do anything to it. It's scooted it back a little bit. It's not bolted down and that's heavy. So, I mean, you were really hitting it. The total unit's about 4,500 pounds. Yeah, well, it looks like it can take a tornado. Now, if you're ever caught in a tornado, even if you're in a shelter, there are a few basic supplies that you're gonna have to have. Let's take a look. You need to have some place to store a little bit of food, preferably dry food that won't spoil, especially things like peanuts. Make sure that you have an emergency scanner so you can listen to what's going on with the weather. A cell phone is always a good idea. A flashlight, plus enough extra batteries for everything. You definitely need some fresh water. Wouldn't be a bad idea to have a conventional radio in there as well. A first aid kit in case an emergency does occur. A blanket if you have to stay in there for a while and stay warm. And a bucket. And I won't really explain what that's for, but if you've ever been camping, you probably know what the bucket's for. And I guarantee you, if you're inside watching a tornado tear your house apart around you, you'll want that bucket. If you'd like more information on how to prepare for a tornado, contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com. We've heard in two of these segments uh, about the testing and research at Texas Tech. Let's return to the Wind Research Engineering Center and take a look at those tests and get some more information on wind resistance. In a number of instances, some small portion, typically a, an interior room, a closet, a bathroom, a pantry, would remain standing even if the house was totally destroyed. So the idea occurred to us rather early in the 70s that if we exerted some effort toward further stiffening and hardening that small room, then we could provide a very high degree of occupant protection with relatively small cost. So that really was the birth of the uh, concept of the above ground storm shelter. What we have observed is that the most common piece of debris that we see is a two by four. And generally speaking again, uh, about a 14 foot two by four, which depending upon the kind of material it is, weighs roughly 15 pounds, is what we see the most of simply because of the, the uh, extent that they're used in construction. When we first got into this business, there was a lot of lure and myth. Uh, there, there were reports in the literature about wind speeds in tornadoes, the speed of sound, uh, and seven, eight hundred miles per hour, and all kinds of strange uh, details of, of the effects of those extreme winds. Uh, so we found little substantive in the literature about wind speeds in tornadoes. 
So one of the earliest contributions here, I, I believe, was working with scientists, meteorologists in particular, uh, arriving at realistic wind speeds for tornadoes. It's uh, not sensible to try to prevent damage in the worst case scenario. You're going to have some damage. Uh, you can reduce the damage by paying close attention to connections in that building and trying to hold it together. Because most of the wind damage occurs at wind speeds, say, well below 200, much of it below 150 miles per hour, and we can prevent that major damage. We think the worst wind speeds we've seen are 200 or below 200, and we're designing for 250. So there again is a margin of safety. This then, which is again is a two by four stud construction, uh, we would probably put a vapor barrier of some type and then either uh, plywood or, a, uh, or an oriented strand board or something uh, to which we could attach the uh, exterior siding. So this with three quarter inch plywood here is, is uh, as strong or stronger than we would find in considerable number of house constructions. And this will, will not nearly withstand the, uh, the debris impacts. Probably, I don't know for sure, but I think a, a two by four traveling at 40 miles per hour would probably pierce this, whereas we're seeking 100. This is the behavior we see when the missile perforates. It simply punches a hole in the wall section. In this case, the, uh, the end of the missile was hardly damaged, blunted a little bit, and the missile would simply have kept on going had it not hit the end of the laboratory. But finally, when it hit the end of the lab, the missile splintered. What we desire to happen, of course, is that this uh, wall section have the ability to uh, absorb or arrest the energy of the missile and stop it or to reflect the energy of the missile back into the, to itself to cause it to shatter as we'll see when we use a more massive wall section here. This wall employs some reinforced concrete. This is two courses of masonry with a, about a four inch concrete uh, layer between it that's reinforced. So this has the mass and the hardness to uh, reflect the energy of the missile back into the missile itself, causing it to shatter as you see here. So I think the secret is either to have reinforced concrete in place as we have here, or to have metal that will give some and absorb the energy before it, it perforates. This was simply a material that we tested for uh, someone at a fiber reinforced plastic uh, that performed successfully. It, the missile impacted right here and it stopped. It caused a little structural damage, but that's of no concern. Once the uh, shelter, uh, once the wall section has repelled the, the missile, then uh, the damage is of little consequence because it's saved the people inside. I think when we assess the public benefits of keeping more people in place, uh, then uh, we, we will find that the, there is a substantial public benefit to the widespread use of shelters in hurricane regions. The major reason for having a shelter in a tornado zone is, is the peace of mind that it offers. If one looks at the probability of being hit at a given location, it's very small. Yet that's not very comforting when weather uh, warnings are issued and, and when you see the devastation caused by tornadoes. I think the, uh, the best reason for having a shelter in a tornado zone is the peace of mind of knowing that a safe place is available and you can go about your normal living patterns feeling that the safest place for you to be is at home.
At the end of the segment on safe room testing, you saw the results from tests performed on fiberglass wall materials. It's a relatively new construction material in homes. The folks at your new house and Steve Eastley toured a plant where these goods are manufactured, and we've got that segment for you. Did you know that they now make wall sheeting materials for the home that can actually withstand the impact of a bullet? Well, today we're in Waco, Texas, and we're going to show you how bullet-resistant wall panels are made. It takes a lot of muscle and patience to make a wall panel that will stop a bullet. They call this paneling armor core, and at the Waco Composites, a four-man team produce about 16 panels a day, enough to cover the walls of an average bedroom. Armor core is made from layer upon layer of a specially coated fiberglass cloth compressed together under a tremendous amount of heat and pressure. The thickness of the panel depends upon the caliber of bullet you want to stop. Wayne, you make four different thicknesses of this bullet resistant material. Why? Steve, we are trying to stop four different uh, weapons here. Level one, Armor Core Level one, is a five sixteenths thick product that's designed to stop a nine millimeter round that looks exactly like this. Here you've got three shots per one square foot panel, and you can see that we defeated or stopped the energy of the yeah, bullet. It's just humped up there, but the exactly. bullet's in there. That's correct. The bullet is locked inside the panel. Level two is designed to stop a 357 Magnum, which is around just exactly like that. That's a much heavier, bigger bullet. Correct, a little thicker panel. And again, you can see that three rounds per this one square foot were stopped and contained within the panel. Yeah. Okay, level three, Armor Core level three is a product that's designed to defeat or stop a 44 Magnum round, which is a bullet exactly like this. That's yeah, much heavier. Much heavier. And here we have two shots per one square foot. Good example of how the product absorbs or defeats the energy of the bullet by delamination process. We call it controlled delamination. Big hump here. That's correct, big but, hump. But it's amazing that this thin material can stop a bullet that big. Correct. Here you have a product we call Armor Core Level 4. That is heavy. That is very, very heavy. Very heavy. Almost 14 pounds per square foot. Here you've got a 300 Win Mag high powered 30 caliber uh, rifle. Now this would be used for what? Well, most common application for level four is in rural situations where you have a home that's concerned about taking stray rounds from deer hunters or an adjacent shooting range. I see. And this um, stopped the bullet as well. The company has its own indoor gun range to ensure that the panels are not only bullet resistant, but ricochet resistant as well. So Wayne, you shot this target three times with a 357 Magnum, is that right? That's correct, Steve, and let's go ahead and open this and get the uh, panel out. See what we got. As you can see, three rounds of uh, 357 Magnum. Let's take a look at the back side. What you have here, Steve, is a perfect example of how the bullet right there, as you can see, has been defeated and contained within the fibers of the panel. So this passed the test? It passed the test. No, uh, no penetration. It's locked within the fibers. And uh, this was probably at about 1,350 feet per second. Wow. It takes nearly two hours to produce a single panel, from the time the fiberglass is stretched to the trimming of the rough edges. Well, Wayne, this looks like the same material that they make fiberglass boats out of. That's correct, Steve. Woven roving fiberglass is used to make a lot of different products. What we have here in making these ballistic panels is the fiberglass is being pulled through a resin bath by this impregnating machine. Here it goes between two uh, squeeze rollers that are squeezing out excessive resin, making sure that the glass is completely wetted out. Then the uh, fiberglass is received on this end onto these call sheets. 
and we'll continue to pull just enough glass to obtain a, a desired level of ballistic resistance. Now the resin is basically the binder that holds all this together and hardens, right? That's correct. The resin is the binder that uh, is, allows all the plies to be squeezed and held together. Now the more plies, the more bullet resistant the, the panel is, correct? That's correct. So what happens after it leaves here? From this stage, after they've pulled out the number of plies they need, this lift table will bring it over and load it into a hydraulic press here where we'll press it at uh, a temperature of probably in excess of 150 degrees for a, a period of roughly an hour at at least 1,500 pounds per square inch. One hour later, the panel is removed from the press, hard as a rock and bullet resistant. So Wayne, after the panels come out of the press, they've cooled down, they come over here, but they sure look rough. Right, Steve, at this point, we bring them over to this saw. It's 16-inch diamond saw that's, that's a wet saw. We trim it down to whatever size our customer's wanting, four by eights and three by eights. Well, this is a four by eight sheet here, right? Exactly, this is a four by eight sheet of level two armor core designed to defeat a 357 Magnum. This is about three eighths of an inch thick. It's three eighths of an inch thick, weighs approximately 137 pounds. Now how do I cut this in a field? It's a good question, Steve. If you're in a field situation, a carpenter can field cut it down to any net size using a uh, skill saw with a masonry diamond disc blade. Well, you know, I've uh, seen pictures of hurricanes and tornadoes where they've actually sent pieces of wood flying through trees and homes. This looks like it'd be a really good material as a storm-resistant panel. Steve, just recently we were uh, tested by the in wind engineering department at Texas Tech University in cooperation with FEMA. As it turns out, these panels are excellent to resist and defeat the energy of a 2x4 that might be propelled by an F5 tornado traveling at in excess of 100 miles per hour. Wow. Well, if I were ever building a home in storm country, I'd definitely consider using this. A 4x8 sheet of level 3 armor core cost about $425. And that means if you wanted to build a 10x12 bullet-resistant room, it would cost more than $4,000. Certainly an option for the homeowner with a heightened need for security. We've had a chance to look at the materials and criteria for building safe rooms. Now let's go to the internet and check out some of the resources that we've talked about today. Start out at the uh, www.fema.gov site. Uh, this is the FEMA webpage, Project Impact. You see that we've got uh, lead stories uh, all through the page here. If we want to find out specifically about safe rooms, we're going to go in through mitigation and prevention. When we go to mitigation and prevention, you see we have a link here to tornado safe rooms. And if we go into that one, get some sound effects here. But you'll notice here that we have a page that talks about taking shelter from the storm. Uh, we have safe room events, funding, some of the initiatives, some of the projects, mitigation. Uh, today we looked at the building performance assessment team. This will describe uh, the team and what they do there. You notice that there are several links here. One is to the residential safe rooms, new expanded second edition. This is the booklet that describes FEMA 320 and talks about the construction plans and cost estimates for putting in an above ground shelter. Uh, you can and uh, get this by contacting uh, the folks. If you just click on this expanded second edition, it'll take you to the uh, toll-free telephone number where you can go ahead and get that book sent to you. Uh, they talk about some of the concrete possibilities here. This is the Portland Cement Association, another one of the corporate uh, partners with FEMA. They're working on some possibilities. And then we go to the Texas Tech University Wind Engineering Research Center. Uh, we're going to head on over to that now. We've, there's still quite a bit of information on the website here at FEMA. You'll notice when you uh, come over to the wind 
site, you get their address, you're leaving the, the FEMA website. This is actually the easiest way to get to Texas Tech. We come forward again, and we're going to be at the uh, Texas Tech WIN site. This is the Wind Engineering Research Center. And uh, where I really wanted to take you on this was protecting the family. They have a, you notice that we've got quite a few uh, menus here. And one of these is protecting your family. How do you protect your family? This has some terrific information in it on protecting your family, what to do, different sites you can go to. Uh, they reference back the tornado and hurricane uh, tips from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, they talk about the American Red Cross. Here we have uh, a website on in-resident shelter. What do you do at home if you're at the mall, if you're in the car, at a ball game? Uh, in fact, we can kind of go forward here and take a look at that. If you go, go to tornado safety tips, uh, you notice they talk about what you do at home, at school, in your car, at a ball game, or at the mall. Now, uh, if we just come down here, you notice uh, at home you have a plan, monitor the weather, uh, an in-resident shelter, again, although a full basement. Uh, do so uh, if you have an outside uh, shelter, and we talked a little bit about that in some of our segments today. Uh, get out as soon as the warning sounds. Uh, what you should do at school, occupant protections for school. There's another website right there. Uh, what do you do if you're in your car, monitoring, uh, driving in open country, drive away from it. Uh, it sounds obvious, but uh, these kind of storms sometimes attract folks. Uh, what to do at a ball game. So we've got some good information here, uh, even beyond looking at in-resident shelters. Our next site uh, is michaelholligan.com. And we wanted to come to this site because here we've got some information for us on various materials you can use to harden up your house. If you remember, we talked about uh, hardening your house today. Uh, if you're a NASCAR fan, you may want to come up here to uh, Team 25, Michael Holligan's uh, NASCAR racing team. Uh, they have daily updates on that, and uh, even if they haven't had a particularly good race, they're pretty upfront about what happened. What I want to do is come down here uh, on the second page. I'm into the television page here, and you'll notice that here we have uh, summaries of all the segments for this week's programming. Remember that uh, Michael Holligan's Your New House is shown on the Discovery Channel, and you can check your local cable listing, your satellite time. Up here, you can see you can either go ahead to the next week, see what's coming up, or go back to previous weeks. Rather than searching through all that, uh, what we've done is we've typed in tornado as a keyword search. And when we go forward from that, you'll notice that we've got all of the segments that are related in some way to hurricanes or tornadoes. Actually, you get both in here. Brick exteriors. Here's the bulletproof paneling segment that we've already taken a look at today. Uh, here are some um, sites on, uh, this is from the framing program, framing a house. This has to deal with tying the frame down to the uh, foundation, storm proofing your home. Uh, here's a segment here on tie downs. Uh, and I think that's the segment that was actually shot in Hawaii. So if you're looking for some good shots of Hawaii, you might want to go there. Here's uh, tornado shelters. You notice here's the opening, uh, one of the ones that we actually looked at here. And let's head on over to this. As an example, here on the tornado uh, shelters page, this is segment 5051. Uh, you can ask Michael questions. You can join a discussion group. Here are the... Uh, tools that you're going to need. And you notice this is what we talked about earlier. Flashlights, the bucket, the radio, the scanner, the tornado shelter, the first aid kit. Here we uh, look at the featured product. This is the tornado shelter we actually looked at. And if you want some information about that, you, here's the size, uh, here's the price. You can actually order it here on the website. Uh, talks about the design, what it is, where it goes. All of these sites and others as you go through are a good way to find out more information about protecting yourself and your family in high wind storms. You will have noticed a bit of blank space between the segments on our broadcast. Learning Again programs are developed as teaching tools, therefore we've separated the host from the program elements so you can cue the tapes comfortably. The segments in this program can be used for presentations to builders and homeowners who might consider adding safe rooms to their structures as well as to public officials who might support safe room construction. Special thanks for today's program go to Tim Hickey, the executive producer of Your New House, and Patty Peterson from the Discovery Channel. You know, as Michael Holligan said in his opening, windstorms are dangerous, but we can fight back. 
On behalf of the staff here at ENET, I'm Ken Stewart. Thanks for watching.